welcome. Welcome. Welcome here in the Press Club Brussels Europe. The presidents and head of state of the NATO member countries have left, including Erdogan, including Joe Biden. And Joe Biden has left, but you are here, especially Ethiopia is now on the agenda here in the press club. We have here a small audience in the European Parliament, according to COVID-19 rules, and we have more than 40 people linked to us via Zoom who would like to listen and to contribute with their ideas and remarks. The title of today is The Tigray People's Conflict in Ethiopia, a voice from the Amhara. And you see me here sitting in the press club accompanied by Willy Fautré, a human rights civil society leader and two representatives from Ethiopia, from the Amhara. But before we will start to speak, I will give the floor to Monika Hürgen, a journalist normally based in Germany and in Brussels, who is on the moment in Portugal, who will give you a short background why we are sitting here together. Monika, it's you. Okay, thank you, Frank. Thank you and um, greeting from Portugal, who is still at the presidency of the Euro European Union in, at the moment. I hope you can all hear me and see me. I don't know if that's the case. Hopefully, yes. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you, Frank. Um, sometimes there are quick changes in politics. So um, we might all remember that there were lots of hope and, and aspiration when Abi Ahmed, the current uh, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia took office in April 2018. There was a lot of hope for peace, also for reconciliation between the different ethnic groups. He even won the Nobel Peace Prize. We all remember that in 2019. But now two years later, there's a completely different picture and uh, Ethiopia is struggling again with a lot of political and ethnic unrest with conflict. In November 2020, the Tigray conflict escalated after the elections were postponed. We all remember that. And since then, we all hear a lot from all kinds of parties. We hear a lot from the Tigray People's Liberation Front. We hear, we hear a lot of um, things from the Ethiopian government, sometimes contradicting each other. Uh, we hear from the United Nations. We hear from NGOs. But there are some voices we do not hear as loudly as others. And we also not hear so much about other regions, because unfortunately it's not only Tigray uh, that uh, is, is a problem for Ethiopia, but Ethiopia is also dealing with other conflicts. And one of the voices we do not hear so much or haven't heard so much so far is that one of the Amhara people. So that's why when the idea came up, um, we said, okay, we're going to organize something. We give you the space and the opportunity today to um, talk about your perspective of the conflict and um, about your sufferings. That does not always mean that we are uh, always agree on everything that we say. We might not be all of the same opinion, but um, nevertheless, here in the heart of Europe, which also stands for freedom of opinion, freedom of speech, we want to give you that opportunity. And we also want to hopefully do give a, make a contribution to reestablish human rights and, and freedom and peace in your country. Because after all, we all know that uh, conflict can only be resolved if we talk to each other and listen to each other. And of course, we also had, sadly enough, we had our own experience here in Europe some years ago uh, with Serbia and with uh, ethnic conflicts being used as a pretext for a lot of human rights violations and political unrest. So we might also learn from all that, exchange our ideas and give the floor to you, the Amhara people, um, as as our way to ensure freedom of speech and um, yeah, and and open up a dialogue that hopefully leads to um, some some better solution. So, with these words, having said that, Frank, I'm giving the floor back to you and um, for you to open the debate and go ahead. And before we will start speaking, we will have a video on the screen. Please, Leo.
People's Liberation Front, or TPLF, came to power in 1991 with ambitions of building an independent nation of Tigray, as per their 1976 manifesto, in which they designated the Amhara people their eternal enemies. In 1995, TPLF, with the support of the Oromo Liberation Front, or OLF, drafted a new constitution for Ethiopia, excluding the Amhara people from the process to impose a system known as ethnic federalism. What followed was a campaign of systematic ethnic cleansing of Amhara people, which included firing of Amhara University professors and ousting Amhara farmers from their land across the country. TPLF systematically killed all of the Wilkait people they thought were educated, intelligent, or who were well-versed in history, and they buried them in the ground. I was under supervision to commit suicide out of despair. Ever since TPLF came to power in 1991, they killed us and destroyed us. In 1992, the OLF, with the support of TPLF, started mass killings of Amharas in the Oromia region. They killed many Amharas, including by throwing them off cliffs alive. They killed nine members of my family. They beat them, including my wife. My brothers let me tell you, they ripped apart my 34 years marriage. The targeting began causing agitation in the Amhara population. The then Prime Minister Malizi Nawi, fearing an uprising, covered up the killings and changed the strategy of the systematic ethnic cleansing to more covert methods, such as forced sterilization of women and simultaneously increasing vulnerability to disease and poverty. Those who were not vaccinated at that time conceived, but we were not able to. This resulted in a decline of 2.4 million people, according to the Ethiopian Census Bureau, and supported by research at Harvard University. In three decades, more than 5 million Amhara has vanished from the census. On November 9, 2020, retreating TPLF militias and a youth group known as Samri carried out a gruesome massacre against Amhara civilians that claimed over 1,000 lives in the town of Maikadra. In 2018, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed Ali came to power and his Oromo Prosperity Party inherited the TPLF constitution. Since this time, the ethnic massacres, mass displacements, and crimes against humanity continued unabated. In the past six months alone, at least 1.5 million Amharas have been displaced, about 2,500 have been killed, and 500 children have been orphaned. You Amharas who speak Amharic must leave our country. They slaughter children and women. I witnessed. They cut a nine-month pregnant woman open, took out the infant, and handed it to her with no mercy. Before they slaughtered them, they inserted wood into the young girl's private parts and watched them suffer. It is very sad to any civil society. I asked him what happened. He said, your sister has been killed, so please take her baby. I passed out, and in between, I lost my own four-year-old son. I don't know where he is. Their main objective was to cleanse the Amharas, and they succeeded in destroying us. They pulled out the elder son. They chased and killed him. They killed all three of my children together and set fire to their bodies. The government militias didn't try to stop them. They burned houses, not sparing children or the elderly. They massacred everyone and you can check the farmland. It is filled with corpses. This is a global call to action against genocide. Please stand with us. Thank you very much. Thank you for this touching video. We will now come to the two speakers here on the panel. And afterwards, we have three additional speakers shortly via Zoom. I will now give the floor to Mesfin Aman, who is an independent political analyst in the Netherlands. Please, Mesfin. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity and uh, I'd like to thank the Brussels Press Club for uh, allowing us to to present or to, to tell to the world uh, what happened to the Amara people. Uh, I think the video tell, tells a lot of a lot of stories after, you know, what happened to the Amara people in the last uh, 30 years. But many, many of us, many Ethiopians were really amazed or surprised or uh, caught by surprise by the reaction of the international community to this kind of atrocity, this kind of suffrage of the Amara people. You know, especially since uh, the, the, the Tigray conflict, almost the, the Ethiopia became the, the whole topic, the whole agenda of the international media. But, but the, the, the real conflict, the real uh, problem behind all this, this conflict is overlooked or, you know, some of the media, 
it seems like deliberately ignored what happened to the Amara people. Uh, it is really frustrating for, uh, for the Amara people or for the people who are really suffering in this, this condition, especially after 2018, after Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed came to power. The, the, the massacre, the, clean, the ethnic cleansing, the genocide, you know, uh, unabated continued in a very mass scale not only in one part of the country, but in almost different parts of the country, sometimes simultaneously. In, in, in one day, we'll, we'll, we'll hear a news of the killing of 250 or 230 people. And one day, we we'll hear a, a story of the, the entire city, a city burned to, to, to ash because of the, the extremist ethno-nationalist groups who, who have some sort of hate or some sort of... Uh, political view against the Amara people. You know, but the double standard, the, 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 the reporting of the international media, the international human rights watch, watchdogs is, is a little bit, you know, kind of frustrating for, for the Ethiopians, for us, because this we support, we are expecting, many people expected, okay, the, the international community will have a fair uh, approach or the, the fair treatment of all kinds of humanitarian disasters or all kinds of humanitarian crisis. But unfortunately, in the last uh, two, three years, we didn't see any, any much attention, any much regard to the, the suffering of the Amara people. It was so, so d disgusting to see that uh, people dying every day, uh, unarmed civilian people, unarmed farmers because, they, because of their identity, because of their, their Amharan identity, because of their religion, because of their political views. They, they, they died every day in Ethiopia, especially after Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed came to power. But the, the attention or the media reporting is all about some particular issues or specific issues about the Tigray conflict. I, we, are, we are not really, uh, you know, criticizing the, the media for covering the conflict in Tigray, but we are, we are, we are missing the balance. We are, we are missing the, the kind of uh, fair approach, fair reporting of the, the crisis in Ethiopia. So it is really, at this moment, if you ask uh, any Ethiopian uh, about the, 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 especially Western media's approach to Ethiopia, everybody tells you a very negative story about the, the Western media Western human rights institutions reporting. I, I, I think we need to really awaken and make, make them aware that there is an ongoing ethnic cleansing, an ongoing genocide in Ethiopia. No one wants to, especially in the West, no one wants to report it, no one wants to, to cover it because of maybe the, the Amara people or the Amara uh, society. We don't have a strong lobby in Washington or in Brussels. I think that's one of the reasons. If, if, you, if we have a lobby, if we have a connection within uh, the, the power center of uh, like White House or in uh, Brussels, maybe we'll have a, a chance to, be, to, to hear, it, or we'll have the chance to, to get you know, attention from the Western government. The, I think this is, a, for me, I try to, to find the answer for this question, but for me, the only reason for the, this unbalanced reporting and unbalanced approach of the Western media and Western human rights watchdogs is because we don't have enough, we don't have connection in the power centers in Washington or in Brussels. I think that is the main reason, but this is not really what humanity, human rights protection or human rights def def defense mean. We need to have kind of common standard for any kind, every human rights violation or any human right, humanitarian crisis. And thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ms. Finn. To make something very clear, the press club here in Brussels, the press club here in Brussels has one function, to be there for everyone who wants to raise its voice. Therefore, the press club and me personally, Frank Schwalbaud, I'm a former member of the European Parliament, a founding member of the German Greens. I'm very happy that you are here today. But in the sense of the French philosopher Voltaire, I might not share your opinion totally, but I will do everything which is possible that you have the possibility to express your opinion. And this is 
the general, the general guideline here in Brussels. And in this sense, I will give now the floor to Lily David. Lily David here on the podium is as well from the Netherlands. Please, Lily. Thank you, Frank. Thank you to the audience, everybody who's present here to listen to us. Um, I'm speaking from the bottom of my heart, from my own uh, view. Um, and looking, looking at the Amara situation in Ethiopia, for me, as a person that was not brought up to identify myself along ethnic lines and lived my life in the Netherlands for such a long time, but when I became more interested in um, seeing the benefit of democracy in the West, I really wish that we have progressed somehow. But we are declining. We are really tarnishing the country we love so dearly that has presented freedom for Africa. And that's so sad. So from that perspective and from humanity perspective, um, I started to look at Ethiopian politics. What can be better? What's, what's going on? So we, um, yeah, yeah all, all of you might know, if you know, if you have been following up the Ethiopian politics, um, you know what kind of uh, system we have since the past 30 years, which is a lifetime for a generation. We have shaped a generation in Ethiopia that can only think along ethnic lines. Unfortunately, we are forced to look at the circumstances from that perspective, unfortunately. And uh, how are we going to improve that? Um, See, and then we really hope, because of the public uprise, like three years ago in Ethiopia, or uh, we had a public uprise since 2016. We were following that up. Uh, a lot of tension. People had enough from the nepotism, the you, you call it uh, the the dictatorship, uh, cor massive corruption, uh, massive division, massive torture, and all that um, uh, really called the nation to rise up. And after that, um, we have seen the change and we really hoped for something better. But unfortunately, there are so many contrasting uh, powers fighting uh, beyond the uh, geopolitics uh, influence on Ethiopia. Um, and also the issue of uh, the GERD, what uh, Ethiopia is tr trying to uh, at least secure itself uh, by having, um, let's say, green energy, right? And that also has created a lot of tension in Ethio on Ethiopia. And we are a big nation. We are the second largest uh, population of Africa. <clears throat> so yeah, we, ha we are a sleeping giant, we can say, right? Uh, so, um, and the Amara people in this are seen, probably historically as well, uh, as seen the patriots of Ethiopia. Uh, of course, there are so many uh, patriot uh, uh, ethnic groups along, along the Amara. But uh, also, uh, that has also portrayed as probably as a, you know, all these influences that want to target Ethiopia has um, targeted the Amara people. And the Amara people, as even myself, I would consider Ethiopia my home. Everywhere in Ethiopia is my home. I could live and work anywhere in Ethiopia, right? You would say, because I live in the Netherlands, wherever I want to go, I can work, I can live wherever I want to go, I move around, you know, and that right is denied for the Amara people, or if they live outside of this ethnic group, as you have seen it in the video, they are seen as settlers, seen as, I don't know, really, it's crazy. And uh, uh, they are not represented, uh, represented politically. Uh, so that means that's a big void. If anything happens to them, there is no one that's going to account their death, their, dis their destruction that has happened to them. Uh, some of them don't even have cell phones. These farmers lived there, survived maybe the 1984 hunger. And now their generation, their children are being chased. And this is from that perspective. And more than a million people are displaced. There, there were many displacements in Ethiopia, and we know that. But now, during this crisis, all the, the state enemy, Amharas, are portrayed primary state enemy of all other ethnic groups in Ethiopia, since we have this ethnic federalism, unfortunately. And I place myself in the shoes of those people. I mean, I don't consider myself as an Amara. How would I walk around? Like, what? I'm a human being, right? I have my own ambition, other things in my head. But some other people see me as an Amara, and they can target me anywhere. So 
and even the regional government of the, the Amara people are not really um, backing this up. They're not really showing up. For, uh, I feel like the Amaras don't have any government. That's really sad. And the suffering of these people, uh, children, unborn, born, so many atrocities happening. It's really sad. I, I wish no one that to happen. So yeah, thank you for listening. And um, I hope Lily, the world Lily. will wake up. <laughs> Lily, thank you very much. You're living in the Netherlands. There no one is asking, are you a Fries? Are you a Dutch? Are you a Limburger? And you're happy with this. Let's hope that this will be one day the future of um, Ethiopia as well. Before we continue now with Willy Fautré, for those who are not Ethiopian, please keep in mind three key informations. First, Ethiopia is the cradle of humanity. The first human beings, or the bones of the first human beings, have been discovered there. There are in the moment 86 officially recognized ethnic groups in Ethiopia. And it is a seat of the African Union. It's a sort of Brussels of Africa. If you keep this in mind, besides all the information you hear now, this evening was a success. But now we are coming to Willy Fautré. Willy Fautré, Fautré is a sort of secret weapon in Brussels for human rights. Why? because he is the founding director of Human Rights Without Frontiers, not Human Rights Watch, but Human Rights Without Frontiers. And every year they are sending around about 350 to 400 newsletters to 11,000 key policy makers. That means if you want to be on this secret list, Contact Willy Fautré, go on the website of uh, Human Rights Without Frontier, and then they might have 11,001, 11,000 or two, or even more. But now I give the floor to Willy Fautré. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank, for, for your kind works and uh, summarizing uh, our activity just in a few words. Um, I, I would like to, to add that uh, uh, we, we try to be the voice of the victims of uh, all sorts of repressions uh, here in uh, Brussels, but not only in Brussels, but also in uh, Geneva uh, and the UN. And so we will be too happy to, to help the Amara people uh, present here and uh, all those that are in, uh, in Ethiopia uh, to help them uh, be heard in not only in Brussels, but also beyond uh, Brussels. Just for the I would say the European uh, viewers of this uh, conference, I think it's important to give the, the big picture of Ethiopia and to uh, remember that it is a country that has uh, 117 million inhabitants. And uh, the territory uh, covers 1.1 million square kilometers. So many times uh, the, the territory of Belgium, I would say. But what, we, the, what is in common with Belgium is that uh, it is a federal state with a federal government, with uh, local uh, governments, and as we have uh, in uh, Belgium. Of course, in Belgium, we don't have such conflicts, uh, uh, fortunately, between the, the linguistic uh, communities uh, of the country. And as Frank uh, told you, there are 86 uh, recognized uh, ethnic groups and probably many more than uh, uh, this number, which makes life living together uh, very complicated. Another dimension, of uh, uh, the demography, uh, I would say, is uh, religion. Uh, so Ethiopian, many Ethiopians are Christians, more than uh, 50%, probably around 60%. We don't know uh, because the, the census, the last census dates back to uh, 2007, if I'm, I'm not wrong. Uh, so 60% Christians and maybe 35% uh, Muslims. But when we go to the Amhara uh, region, uh, they represent uh, more than 90% Christians. Uh, and they are mainly from the Orthodox uh, Church, the local Orthodox Church, uh, in contact with the Coptic Church in Alexandria. And um, 
on the in the Oromo uh, region, it's uh, about uh, 45 percent maybe of Muslims and uh, 35 percent of uh, Christians. I wouldn't say that there is a, an interreligious conflict uh, in this uh, part of. Uh, of Eritrea, but anyway, it's part of it, and it's very difficult, if not impossible, to separate what is ethnic and what is religious in the identity and in the minds of people when they target a mosque or when they target a, a church. I, I just read a, a report by A to the Church in Niedkirche in Note in, in, in Germany, where they were listing all the attempts against mosques and uh, uh, churches uh, in. Uh, in, uh, in um, Ethiopia, and it's uh, absolutely uh, amazing, although it's more an ethnic uh, problem than uh, a, a religious uh, problem. Now, uh, to come to the broader picture of uh, this issue, uh, and as, as it was said uh, before, Tigray has attracted all the attention of the media and has a little bit forgotten what has happened in other parts of the, the, the country. So I will, in a few minutes, uh, summarize what are the challenges and, and what are the difficulties and what are the realities on the ground of uh, uh, this uh, uh, situation. So the war between, is between the federal government and, uh, uh, for the moment, the ruling party of the regional stay, state of uh, Tigray. That has been on the radar on the, of the media and human rights organizations since the beginning of that conflict that uh, goes back to the, to the, the first days of uh, November. The, the reason was that the federal government postponed the national elections to 2021, and by the way, it's, it's, again, it has been postponed uh, this year, justifying its decision by the COVID-19 related uh, risks while several opposition parties condemned uh, this move. In Tigray, the officials decided to hold their own uh, elections in September in defiance of the federal government's uh, directive. And so a few weeks later, beginning of November, 4th of November, to be accurate, Prime Minister Abiy, just remember that uh, he, was, uh, he got the Nobel Prize, Peace Nobel Prize, uh, three years ago, uh, for settling the, the problem, uh, the border problems with uh, Eritrea, but apparently not being able to solve the, the internal problem. So Prime Minister ordered the military to take action against the ruling party in Tigray in retaliation of what he described as an attack against by the Tigray regional forces on the federal military uh, basis, triggering afterwards all sorts of significant clashes between regional and federal forces. As a consequence, the Tigray conflict acted as a smoke screen, which hid and continues to hide other violent inter-ethnic conflicts, mainly between Amara and Oromo peoples, the two most popular ethnic groups in the Ethiopia. And they, unfortunately, they largely remain underreported or unreported. The security and human rights situation in Ethiopia further deteriorated as Prime Minister Abiy struggled to maintain order or quite often failed to do it amid growing internal arrest, uh, unrest and uh, political tensions. The human rights landscape is now defined by ongoing abuses by government security forces, attacks on civilians by armed groups sometimes identified, sometimes not identified, deadly violence against communal and ethnic lines and a political crisis. Social violence is undoubtedly now on the rise and quite a number of those incidents took place before the Tigray conflict as the video uh, showed you, but they failed to sufficiently mobilize the international community. For example, concerning the Amara. November 2019, Amara students, 18 Amara students, 14 uh, girls and uh, four young men from Dembidolo University in Western Oromia were abducted by unidentified people as they fled the Baibas fatal ethnic clashes between Oromo and Amara in the university. Then uh, they have been missing 
sins and of course we can fear for the worst after uh, more than two years. This stoked anger at the government over its inaction and lack of transparency. Inter-ethnic violence afflicted, affected more than 20 other universities' campuses in 2019, mainly in the Oromia and Amara regions, and continued in 2020, prompting an estimated 35,000 students to flee. Another example, one year later, November 2020, at least 54 people from the Amara ethnic group were killed in an attack by suspected members of the Oromo Liberation Army, OLA. The attack on Gawa Kanga village in Guliso district of the West uh, Welaga zone took place just a day after the Ethiopian Defense Forces troops withdrew from the area unexpectedly and without any explanation. Witnesses said dozens of men, women and children were killed, property looted, and what the militants could not carry away, they set on fire. The fact that this horrendous incident occurred shortly after government troops abruptly withdrew from the area in unexplained circumstances raises a number of questions and have not been that have not been answered by the federal government. The Amara people expect that Ethiopian authorities investigate what happened and prosecute those responsible for the attack through fair trials. This year, a lot of incidents this year. You cannot imagine in March, April, how many I could find on, on internet so, or from open sources. Again, a few examples. 25th of February of this year, 12 people at least, including a seven-year-old child, were hacked to death in two particularly brutal attacks in the villages of Boca and Nechlu in the eastern part of Oromia. Multiple sources told Al Jazeera at that time. Six and nine March, 42 people were killed in two separate attacks that targeted Amhara civilians in Oromia's Horogudru district according now to the official Ethiopian uh, media. Victims usually blame the massacres on fighters belonging to the Oromo Liberation Army, OLA. What is the OLA? It is a breakaway armed wing of the Oromo Liberation Front, OLF, which was founded in the 1970s to fight for the self-determination of the ethnic group of uh, uh, or, or almost. In 2018, promises of political reform by the then newly appointed Prime Minister Abiy saw the OLF decriminalized and permitted to join party politics. But negotiations with the army, with the armed wing, eventually soared and the OLA splintered from the political organization and resumed fighting. So I have many more examples in, uh, in March and uh, April with uh, horrible massacres uh, targeting on purpose the Amhara uh, people. Just to mention that you said you didn't have a, a voice uh, in Brussels, you didn't have a voice in the United States, but you have an Amhara Association of America in, in Washington. And I, I saw that uh, Theodros Turf, the chairman of that association, was also very active. And he said only for the, the, the month of March of this year, over 300 Amaras, including women and children, had been massacred by the Oromo Liberation uh, Army. And he also accused the government of being silent and inactive on the killings. As a <clears throat> conclusion, I would say, we should ask uh, ourselves, but what is the origin of all these inter-ethnic uh, conflicts? In fact, <clears throat> the successive federal governments of Ethiopia, since the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front, EPRDF, uh, as we know, assumed power in 91, have their share of responsibility in the current situation in Ethiopia, including the Prime Minister Abi as they all failed to address the real roots of the inter-ethnic conflicts, which are 
the inappropriate designing, redesigning of the regional borders, which partly ignored their historical ethnic characteristics and their rights. As Ethiopia was transformed from a unitary to a federal state, nine new regional states were designed according to Article 46 of the Constitution of 1995 on the basis, and I quote, of settlement patterns, language, identity, and consent of the people. Yet, the borders of the new regional states crisscrossed former administrative delineations and were simply imposed without popular consent through a referendum or election. Administrative borders between the regional states have been altered during all regime changes in Ethiopia and are often used and misused and instrumentalized as a means for the federal government to divide and rule by maintaining political control over local nobility and political elites aspiring for central power. A few years ago, the US representatives uh, of, uh, in uh, Washington, of the House in Washington, adopted a resolution, Resolution 128, entitled Respect for Human Rights and Encouraging Inclusive Governance. Human rights and encouraging and inclusive governance should also be the compass of the European Union. The Tigray War and the dramatic humanitarian crisis in that region should not be a smokescreen hiding other atrocities in the country and the Amara region. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Willy, for this very intensive and knowledgeable overview. I think it enlightened all of us. You heard, you will hear now for the third time that it's 86 different ethnic groups officially recognized. A short remark, personal remark from my side. I have a daughter, her mother is Brazilian, her father, me, is German. And one day when she was six, seven, she came home very nervous. I said, what's happening? You can't believe in my class there is a girl, a new girl. I said, yes. Her parents are from the same country. I said, this is impossible. Yes, 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 you can't believe it. And she's nice nevertheless. <laughs> this is reality in Brussels. But now we have heard people who are sitting here in front of the small public here in Brussels. And now, now we are coming to three panelists who are not here from three different continents who will be linked to us. It is first from the US, Sinaid Dereje, afterwards Mirza Mohamed from Ethiopia, and then from Sweden, Girma Berihanu. And afterwards, I ask already my co-moderator in Portugal, Monica Hugen, to prepare one or two questions, but then it is for you, for you, the public here, and for you, the public via Zoom, to ask questions or coming, come with short comments. I give now the floor to the US, to Senaid Dereje. Please, Senaid. Thank you very much. Um, I really, Wonderful. <laughs> I really would like, like to thank the organizers, Brussels Press Club and HRGW for this. And um, honestly, really would like to thank all the speakers before me. Uh, I will try to remove um, that uh, areas that has already been very beautifully and truthfully covered. So um, what I would like to address is what is happening to the Amara people and why? Um, later, I hope I'll get the chance to come back and, and discuss uh, how it's happening and what Amaras are doing about it to mitigate it. Yes, and it will be, uh, my dear, it will be two times four minutes, okay? Okay, Good. perfect. So now I'll just focus the why. Because this is Africa, um, people always kill each other, and there is this sentiment, unfortunately, where conflicts happen. They just either are over resources, or there is a form of generalization from the rest of the world. So we tend to go with, uh, you know, whatever the agenda of the day is. 
Um, luckily, a, a lot of the earlier speakers have covered why this is happening and why Amaras being, um, I mean, Amaras are being targeted in a horrific way. But I really want to give the logic behind it. Why is it happening? So uh, Frank very clearly uh, mentioned that Amaras are one of the 86 ethnic groups in Ethiopia. Also, Amaras are similarly affected by the usual problems uh, people in the third world country face, like their compatriots, life has deliberately been made dangerous, specifically to Amaras in Ethiopia, since the imposition of the ethnic federalism. So when TPLF and other armed rebel groups took power, deposing the military dictatorship, the first thing they did, uh, and this is not rhetoric, their evidences, is designed the political platform in such a way that Amara voices were not represented. So the, the problem starts with not being represented, underrepresentation and non-representation. So when I say this is not just rhetoric, every legal framework and policy that was implemented was designed to exclude Amaras. Tangible examples include the fact that every major region that is labeled under ethnic identity had the ethnic identity written as the owner of that region in the regional or state constitution except in the Amara region where the region geographically just on the map is labeled Amara, but it proclaims the land belongs to its residents. So imagine having an ethnic federalism and apartheid system that apportions land for a given ethnic identity and having the second largest group, even according to the government statistics, that was the initial, like not, not uh, given any, any land to their name. So that was the initial precursor in the foundation of all the genocidal attacks and the ethnic cleansing to come. The EPRDF coalition divided the nation along ethnic lines and they did it without a single Amara party being represented in the process. So even if the whole Ethiopians, if that's what they wanted, uh, Amaras were not represented. As a result, Amaras lost the vast areas of their home states which were arbitrarily and exclusively restricted to the specific ethnic groups, turning a nation where all, you know, we all of us lived together for centuries into an apartheid state where some are not welcome in some areas based on their ethnic identity. So why target Amar specifically though? Well, it was separatists who were allowed to rule the country. Imagine a group who wanted to take a piece of you uh, being allowed to manage you as a whole. So their major goal is to make sure that there is an exit strategy like we're seeing now with the wars, uh, with the war in Tigray and the, you know, the, the operation that earlier the Abiy administration did in Somali region. You know, an exit strategy, if them ruling Ethiopia is not successful to make that happen, you know, they, they need to make regions in order for them to separate, they need to make these regions homogeneous. They're drawn on paper, but they have to be real in the, on the ground. The only scene of Amaras is living all over the country. And as an indigenous group that lived there for thousands of years, that's something you would expect. But that defies the new boundaries they have drawn. So basically, the why revolves around, given that Amaras occupy vast areas of the nation, it becomes impossible to carve out homogeneous ethnic nation states without the removal of people like, you know, Amaras, Kurages, Gamos, Sadias, and Walaitas, who for centuries lived across the Ethiopian nation. Amaras and few other specific identities that are hunted for the same reason were also easy targets as they didn't organize along the ethnic line uh, for political purposes. Uh, so there was not an organized political entity that debunks all the hate rhetoric that was instilled in Ethiopians through education, media, and the discourse from the, the ruling party. So the often cited reason that Amaras are killed due to the historical grievances is incorrect and immoral at so many levels. The major um, reason being you do not justify the, mass the massacre of children and innocent men and women uh, by citing historical accounts from hundreds of years ago. While history could be debated and translational and restorative justice can be applied, it's inhuman and nonsensical to commit heinous crimes against humanity to settle perceived historical scores. So hence the senseless ethnic targeting, attacks, massacres, and mass exodus from all over the country just because they're Amaras. So this doesn't stop with Amaras. I just would like to reiterate and wrap up. The system is genocidal itself. It, it was a failed experiment. Sure, 
there are always inter-ethnic differences. There are uh, religious differences. But it's not the same when you put the skirmishes on steroid by basing the administration, the legal and security frameworks on the nation along ethnic lines. So therefore, with similar distribution, there were others who were affected, uh, Brages, Kores, who are being killed off right now because they don't confirm the area where the Oromo original state wants to expand into. In the past, during the TPLF-led regime, there were Anyuak massacres. There were Somalis being massacred in, in Somali region. And even what's happening in Tigray, it is part of the same problem. So the, the, the major group that was in power, the minute it's removed, uh, it's people being are attacked because you know it, it's just hiding behind ethnic um, identity. So if the the system is successful in actually homogenizing according to its plan, you know all administrative units, not just states, but down to precincts and districts. What happens then? Every conflict will automatically be genocidal because now you have your units totally homogenized, and whoever is powerful, powerful enough and has the state, the state apparatus will be killing off all the other homogenized regions. So let's look into the root cause. No one is against federalism or decentralization. Um, let's just do it in a human way. Every horror from Tigray, Eritrea border up in the north to Moyali, up to the southern border with Kenya, every problem we have, and all this inhuman, uh, ex along with the tyranny and the dictatorship and the corruption, is to do with it, this ethnic federalism. The experiment Thank has you. failed. Help us remove it. Changing prime ministers alone is not enough. We've seen three of them under the system. It's not a solution. Change the whole thing and save us. Save Ethiopians, save Amaras. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tonight, with your plaidoyer against homogeneization, to make a state, a region homogeneous. And we here in Brussels or we in the Netherlands have to smile about this because nothing like this is here with us. Now we are coming to the second contributor from outside. It is Mirsa Mohamed. She is based. She's based in Ethiopia. And Mirsa, it's now you. Please. And remember, four to five minutes. Please. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. I really appreciate the Brothers Club uh, for giving this opportunity for the voiceless Amharas. It means a lot for us to get such kinds of opportunity to tell the world what's happening in Ethiopia on specifically in Amhara. So uh, though our government is busy in holding uh, election within four days, our country is really in a very serious massacre and displacement, hunger and other uh, problems, especially Amhara people are suffering uh, due to these problems. So let's see what's happening in short. So uh, I have a very specific uh, or a limited time. There is a systematic repression against uh, ethnic Amhara in form of due to a narrative that the nature toward this Amhara uh, called as Neftanya because of this rhetoric. Dozens of Amhara are killing in Oromia region in uh, South Nation and Nationalist uh, region and also in really in Amhara region also. So uh, as I went and asked and uh, discussed with the survivors in Shashamini, Arisi, Bali, Zuai, Agarfa, uh, these are regions where, which are found in Oromia, these are small towns which are found in Oromia. There are more than 300 people are killed and thousands are displaced in West Oromia. And also in uh, Weleka, more than 600 are killed in different rounds. It, the killing or the massacre was not once and completed once. It was uh, repeated again and again, and at least it has been for six or uh, seven rounds. This is only in the last three months after the change or after Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed came to power. And more than 10,000 Amharas are displaced and trying to survive in different Amhara regions. Those people who are migrated from this Wellega, they came to Desi, uh, Dabratabor, and Buri uh, towns. Those who are 
uh, displaced from this Ost Western, uh, Eastern Oromia. They are still suffering in churches and uh, the, some of them are living in their relatives home because the government even couldn't give them a kind of a campus and places to survive at least. And also, uh, the other place, Benshin Gulgoms, Amhara is uh, one of the most populous ethnic group in this uh, region in Benshin Gulgoms. And in terms of influence, the Amhara are the most influential. And in terms of even economy, they play a leading role in this region. But all these factors contribute to their killings because the killers consider themselves as an indigenous population. So they think the resources are controlled by others or the settlers. They consider the Amaras as the settlers, so they are uh, planning to uh, completely destroy and clean from their uh, state. So, for example, on December, uh, on 23 December 2020, at least 250 Amharas were uh, reportedly killed in one day. And again, on 16 January 2010, according to, even according to the uh, Human Rights Commission report, an estimated 500 people have lost their lives. This is in a specific area with a specific days. More than 250 Amhara Agaos, in some places they called them Agaos, displaced and suffering in Hamara region, small town called Chagni Ranch. More than 500, I mean 5,000 houses are burned in this area. 5,000 houses are burned. 250,000 people are. Uh, living in campus, which is called ranch. In this place, people are suffering uh, from hunger. Even there is no one could serve them uh, food and other uh, materials to survive even. At least 50 innocent civilians had been brutally massacred in October 2020, again in Guraferda. Guraferda is a place which is found in South Nations and Nationalities region. Uh, actually, uh, the people of Amhara in Guraferta are suffering by ongoing killings and displacements every single day since TPLF have come to power. And in Hamara region itself also, there is uh, a mass killing. Uh, I can uh, mention two places in Hamara region, uh, the Maikadra and the South, I mean, the Northern Nation, which is specifically called Atayi. In Maikadra, Though the genocide was started since TPLF came into power and uh, took Makadra uh, and Welkait and other cities under Tigray region, but the massacre, the ethnic cleansing and mass murders carried out in uh, November 9 up to 10, uh, 2020. Almost more than 600 people were massacred uh, within two days. Even anyone can see the mass graves uh, in the city. Uh, more than uh, four, 40 and 50 people are uh, mass grabbed in this, this place in my cadre. Anyone can see it, can observe in any time. Uh, uh, I was uh, there before three days and the people are still crying there. The people are still uh, uh, worrying and no one is again there to, for their uh, to be uh, yeah, saved so, or yeah, to so, save yeah. them. Yeah, so. Thank you. I feel totally you would have liked to continue speaking because you have a lot of more to say, but I think it was touching, touching for us to hear what you had to report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miyatsa from the US. Oh no, pardon, Ethiopia, from Ethiopia, directly from Ethiopia. And we are now going north. We are going north to Sweden, to Girma Beirano, Professor Girma, please, you and afterwards, Monika Hogan with, zwei, with two questions, please. Okay, thank you very much everybody. Uh, and uh, I'm so moved by uh, the, the panelists' this presentation. I have been uh, depressed a lot of time that uh, Europeans don't understand the complexities of our countries. And I'm so humbled and, and really comforted by the two panelists uh, from the, from the Brussels Press Club, how they captured the intricacies, the insanely complex situation that Ethiopia finds itself. I mean, I need <laughs> several hours to present my thesis, you know, but uh, most of, you know, the previous panelists have said most of the important features of the, the Amara uh, uh, tragedy. 
my thesis revolves around uh, the Western media and politics role in European, in Ethiopian conflict. And I'm not categorical. I'm not blaming everybody. I'm not uh, praising everybody. It's a complex situation. Most media outlets and aid organizations, humanitarian organizations, do not seem to take this insanely complex situation and the future of the whole country into account. As Sanai tried to, to, to raise, you know, Ethiopia is, you know, a, a country of 80 plus uh, ethnicities and it's so complex, it's an old country and you need to really, really uh, uh, come closer uh, 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 to understand it. And our focus in this meeting, as I understand it, I mean, I cannot cover all my uh, notes. So is the most important in this meeting, this meeting must be on making Ethiopians and fair-minded fair people the world over, including this, this club members, aware of the failure of Western media. I'm personally shocked and surprised and unsettled by the sheer extent of media space these doubtful accounts took, like, you know, evidence bias and dubious journalistic quality. Uh, I mean, th what I'm trying to say is that the, 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 uh, the ignored genocide on the Amara side, I mean, which has been uh, going on for the last 30 years, little is uh, reported and over-reported. I mean, what happened in, in the Tigray region? And we know that half of the news that come out is, has no substantial basis. So this is a travesty of justice, okay? So this, I'm, 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 I'm just aiming at the European politicians or Western politicians and the media. I want to say that there is, I mean, my argument is that there is, there is uh, uh, what is it called, uh, incestuous relationship between the media and, 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 the, and the politicians. That's one of my points. And um, even more worryingly, both the European Union and the United States have been engaging with Ethiopia in a manner that doesn't focus on the greater good and couldn't bring peace and unity in Ethiopia and stability in the Horn of Africa. So homework has not been done by Western countries, including news uh, media. And all this that they didn't do their homework has led to, is, is leading to wrong policy actions. So Ethiopians, I feel, I mean, I can't, I can't speak for Ethiopians. I mean, uh, I feel betrayed and disappointed by this biased reporting and, and policy measures. For instance, the Mali or, you know, uh, or Myanmar, Myanmar <laughs> former Burma, mm -hmm. crimes against humanity are being investigated by the Office of the United Nations. However, the ethnic cleansing of Amaras is mostly ignored. The Amaras, as, you know, Sanait and uh, Lily explained, are still massacred as we speak displaced and threatened in the Western, Southwestern, Eastern and Central Ethiopia. But the central government and the rulers who govern these regions of genocide are still calling it conflict, ethnic conflict or uh, intra-community intra, intra clashes, spontaneous clashes. And there are denial, denial by, by the, I mean, I'm blaming also the Ethiopian government in this, in this, uh, 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 process. So the Western media, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the Western media's reporting on the conflict in Northern Ethiopia has been unbalanced and consistently biased against Ethiopia. This should come as no surprise because the Western media is doing little, no investigative reporting. It doesn't even try to give a complete picture of the conflict. It has not looked carefully at the roles that the TPLF has played in the Ethiopian problem. Uh, let me give you one example. I hope I have time. Less than a week, after fighting between the TPLF and government forces began in November, a community comprised largely of ethnic Amaras were targeted by a Tigrayan youth group known as Samri, okay, who are believed to be sympathetic to the TPLF. On November 9, 2020, at least 1,200 people, some people say 800, doesn't matter, in the town of Maikadra were brutally murdered in homes they shared with fellow seasonal workers and their families. The victims were largely Amara. And they killed hundreds of people, beating them with buttons, sticks, stabbing them with knives, machetes and hushes, and uh, strangling them with ropes. I mean, this is reported by the Ethiopian right, Human Rights Commission uh, and other uh, uh, reported uh, uh, reports. It has been, uh, yeah, 
uh, so ethnic apartheid uh, system, I mean, one of the, is the culprit for all this problem. Arbitrary boundaries based on ethnicity have led to ethnic distrust, as we know, and uh, competition. Um, Gilmar, and politics, are you coming to an end? Can, can you please come to an end? Yes, yes, okay. As, uh, I mean, uh, what I'm trying to say is this, re is this relative re uh, silence uh, 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 regarding the weekly killings of Amara in, in, in this part of uh, the country is worrying. International human uh, organizations, I mean, oh, yes, uh, I therefore wish to bring the, the world's attention to the warning that the crisis currently unfolding in Ethiopia can both potentially become a devastating conflict with serious repercussions on the ground, a conflict where genocide is being actively cultivate, cultivated by politicians and media broadcasters. This in turn raises the issue of mass displacement of population with serious consequences for the international community. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much with your appeal to the international community to change the cap. And we all have listened to you and we've seen your professor, the number of books behind you and the IKEA shelves, you're based in Sweden, we see it and you've read a lot and you certainly can give a lot to your students. I'm now giving the floor to Monika Högen for two short questions and then the floor is opened. I see already two people who would like to speak here from the public. First, it's Wolfgang Pape, and then it's Andy Verhout. Monica, please, it's you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Frank. Yeah, first of all, also thank you for all those contributions, which were really uh, touching and, and, and shocking. And I also followed up the chat a little bit. So there were many more um, examples of, of human rights abuses. And uh, sadly, sadly so. Uh, of, uh, obviously, there are a lot of sources talking about that. Um, but I would like to maybe to switch a little bit from now. We have heard about the problems and you described them very much, but maybe to my questions would uh, try to find out about solutions. There were two things which uh, popped up um, all the time you criticized um, the ethnic-based federalism and you also criticized very much uh, the, the role of the Western media. So my questions to the panelists would be for both of them, uh, how could we um, solve those problems? So the first quest question would be, um, is there any chance that you can get out of this uh, obviously devastating system of ethnic-based federalism? Are there any, any chances, any initiatives to get out of that? Is there a chance for that to come to a different political system? That would be the first question. And the second question would relate it to the Western media. I mean, I agree that there might be some media that are completely ignorant, but some of them might not report um, in the way you wanted to, because also um, they might not be able to, you know, to, to, to grasp all that complexity. So the second question would be, what could you do to help Western media to report in a different way? Thank you. Thank you very much, Monica. And now the questions here from the ground. And please, Monica, identify two or three questions which have arrived via Zoom. For the questions now, I have been member of the European Parliament, and you can't believe it, but it's true. Average speaking time in the European Parliament is not half an hour, not 10 minutes, not five minutes, it's two minutes. Therefore, I ask you in your question to stick with one minute. First, Wolfgang Pape. Wolfgang Pape is a retired civil servant from the Commission. He has just published a book, 600 pages about foreign affairs politics on omnilateralism. Please, uh, Wolfgang Pappe. Thank you very much. I want to relate to the microphone. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Please go there. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. I want to relate directly to Monica's question on the Western media. I fully understand that they are underreporting on Ethiopia as a whole particularly the problem of Amhara, it's obvious. And I appreciate very much that you enlighten us here on this issue. But when you call about Western media, you think of non-Western as well. And I wonder, particularly the role of China in Ethiopia. China has more than 50% holding the debts of Ethiopia. This is enormous influence it could have. Do you have any representation in Beijing, for instance? Do you see any us other than Western media being better than those Western media? Thank you. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. And the next is Annie Verhout. Please come as well 
to the speaker's corner, please. Uh, one minute. Huh? Uh, I have I have some questions. I think no, I have three one. questions. Can I have the three questions? Yes, do I have the time to have the three questions? But I cannot do it in one minute. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Andy Vermoot. I'm uh, asking my questions on behalf of the International Alliance for the Defense of Rights and, and Liberties with consultative status at the United Nations and the Fundamental Rights Movement non-profit organization, Postperson. Because of this important conference, thank you, Frank. Uh, and Laurent from the press group, the world is now aware that mass killings, large-scale torture, and rape of women and girls are taking place in the region. Based on ethnic identity, is this in fact a genocide? Why is the Ethiopian Prime Minister Abe failing to end these hostilities towards the Amhara people? Why does he not protect the Amhara people? The International Alliance for Defense of Rights and Freedoms calls on the Europe Ethiopian authorities to grant access, immediately access, to all humanitarian organizations and staff from the United Nations High Commissioner of Human Rights to conduct an independent investigation into all human rights violations towards the Amhara people. We, with the International Alliance for the Defense of Rights and Freedoms, also urge the international community to hold the perpetrators of human rights violations accountable. We are willing to join the international community in pressuring the Ethiopian government to advocate for a full humanitarian access for the Mahara people. The International Alliance for Defense of Rights and Freedoms wants the stationing of blue helmets in this conflict area. Because this is not the only conflict in Ethiopia. And if not, is this a proposal that we can push for? How to convince the United Nations Security Council uh, for these blue helmets? Are there efforts with the international forums to establish these blue helmets there? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. We have now a third question. Please come here. It is from Kagidan Abi, and then I will ask. Monica, to identify three questions via from those who have been deposited at Zoom. Please, Akidan Abi from Belgium. Uh, this is directed at Willy, actually. Um, in the past three years or so, more than 100 churches have been attacked, and at least half, including Bible schools, were burned down. Hundreds of Orthodox Christians have been viciously attacked, Thousands have been displaced because of their religious beliefs. Um, after the attacks of 30 churches, actually, in October 2019, Pope Francis himself offered prayers for the killings of 45 Christians, including clergy. My question to you is, given your expertise in this area, how can the Ethiopian Orthodox Church and its her followers attract meaningful attention for transparent investigation into their ongoing prosecution from international community and human rights organizations such as yours, uh, the HW, the HRWF. Thank you, thank, thank you. you, thank you. Thank you, Kian. and now, thank you, Kian. and now I'm giving the floor to Monica, for three questions, two or three questions from the Zoom. Yeah, Frank, um, I would propose to do it differently because what I'm having here in the chat is rather remarks than um, questions directly um, addressing the uh, panelists. But what I have here is I have two persons I had um, who were raising their hands. There was one Debesso, gmail.com, and someone um, calling him or herself Truth never dies. So if you still want to raise your questions, you raise your hands. Maybe you can just um, yes. um, write down it's your questions. Very good, or very good idea. Put on, your camera, or put on your camera or your audio so that we can listen to your questions directly. Also, yes. anyone else who wants to ask a, sh but a short, please short question so that we still no. have time for answers. These two you have mentioned, please raise your hand and switch on your camera. One, That's what they raise their hands. Two, so now we, if you want to 
No, we put don't on see your them. camera and your audio and we can hear and see you. It's now, it would be your opportunity. To it's now or nowhere, now or never. Exactly. <laughs> You don't see I'm, I'm calling up the Beso. The Beso here, I don't know who or where you are, but if you want to raise your question now, you rather can either you type it into the chat or please put on your camera and your microphone that, so that we can hear and see you, which would be even better. But you would, you, you would to do, have to do that now, now. <laughs> mm. Okay, there seem to be technical problems. And please write down your question in the chat and I will make sure that... Um, the, and the other person you have identified, please, Monica. There's uh, someone, it's an organization, I think it's called Truth Never Dies. So the same goes for you. If you want to say something, please do it now. Otherwise, please write it down. And in the meantime, ah, here's someone coming up. Otherwise, maybe Frank, you can go on with oh, answering no, okay. the questions we have, and then we try yes, to exactly. solve those things later. Because we have, we are now still on Zoom for five minutes. Three hundred seconds, please. The answers. Let's start with Lily. Yes. <laughs> I think that I think if I um, correctly state, the first question was from Monica uh, asking what solutions, right? Focusing yes. on solutions and the Western media and also the gentleman over there asked um, um, what the role of China could be, right? Since China has its feet on Africa. Well, Western media, um, I mean, in the world, we have a lot of stuff going on. So uh, where do you put your attention on? Uh, it depends on, um, yeah, right? The connections, networks you have. And um, uh, I think this is a good start today that we will have a mutual uh, link and connection. So let's hope that um, we keep in touch and then uh, highlight this situation from now on. Um, so yeah, it's a good start. I would Thanks, say. Lily. The next answer will be from Mesfin. Mesfin Aman. Yes, I, I just I got uh, three or four questions. How do we move out of this ethnic federalism? I think this is a crucial question. Uh, because we, we need to address this, this, this problem fundamentally. So the, 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 as uh, Dr. Sunlight uh, put it very clearly, the, 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 main, the, the main reason, the main uh, rationale behind all this ethnic conflict, violence, genocide is the ethnic politic, ethnic, ethnic based federal arrangement. It was the 1991 ethnic based federal arrangement designed by the TPLF and the Oromo Liberation Front just to stay in power and to marginalize the majority of the Ethiopian people. So we need to have a new political settlement in Ethiopia. We need to create a new political arrangement. I think that is, that is the best solution. We need to start to negotiate on how to restructure the country, not based on ethnicity, but based on geography, based on other, other qualifications, because I don't know. Imagine in Africa, you know, you are, uh, politi you're, you're politicizing or you are promoting ethnicity. You are using all your, your political activities based on ethnicity. It is just like uh, an atom bomb for Africa. It happened. We have seen it in, in Rwanda. We have seen it in other countries. I, I don't know because that is the problem for, for many Westerners, many external observers. They didn't understand it. They didn't catch up with it. The other is China's role. I, I don't think China, China, China has any interest on human rights or uh, democratic issues. They are, they are going to Africa to do business. They do investment. They, they, don't, they don't care about everything. So that's why we like them yeah. and they like us. That's fine, Ms. Fim. And now it's Billy. Yeah, thank you very much for, yeah. thank you very much for that question about the situation of uh, uh, the churches and uh, also the, the, the mosques uh, and the interreligious uh, uh, acts of violence uh, between the, the two communities. In fact, you know, I follow everything about religious freedom around the world, and I have never seen any information coming from uh, Ethiopia. It is very occasionally that I got one or two news. So it means that you must, you must organize yourself uh, and to distribute news. Thank you. 
the European Union has an external action service and they have a department for conflict resolution. NGOs exist, safer world, search for common ground. They all, I think, would be prepared to intervene and to assist to overcome this ethnic-based federalism. And it's you, it is you, the Ethiopian and the Amama, who have to influence the Western media. We are now coming to a total end. I think Zoom is going away Frank. now. Frank. Huh? Who? Monica okay, wants Monica, to... oh, Monica, we are yeah, now- I in... just have to, I know, but I wanted just to inform you that we do have two important questions here. One question is why we think or you think the EU is siding with TPLF, something what someone is assuming here. And the other question is why, what, what, what are the next steps of the EU after this hearing? Maybe we just have to clarify that tonight this is not an official EU hearing. This is just an initiative okay. of us in the press club, okay. just to clarify that. But, okay, um, I can give an answer to these two questions. Okay, it's please. Very, it's an answer to this question, to this question. It's very simple. You have to put your acts together. You have to organize among yourselves. You have to plan events. You have to identify those media who are, are the most interested in your issue potentially, to influence them, to install personal relations, to install credible transmission of the things which are happening, to link with the, social, with the civil society you we have here one representative from the NGO community. And never forget, the Chinese proverb is to make a hole in stone, in granite. It's a permanent drop of water on the same place. And therefore, I think we are all happy that this was first, today, the first event of this sort. And there were other events, hopefully, in the pipe, either here with us or with others but it depends on you, because never forget, mm. it's my experience from being a politician. 39 years ago, I became for the first time member of parliament. There is no justice in the world. It depends on those people who are concerned that they formulate what they want, and that they insist, 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 and make pressure. No one is doing anything for you when you sit in your office, when you sit wherever and asking, those who are not helping us, no, no. You have to help yourself. You have to create an environment that people know, understand, and possibly join your fight. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. To the polls All the of those who listen and those who have not listened, I hope to see you in another context. Greetings, greetings from Brussels to all of you. Greetings. Ethiopia heads to the polls in the first parliamentary election since Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed came to power. A recent rise in ethnic tensions and clashes has become a major focus for the political parties and indeed the people. Well, the violence has claimed thousands of lives and forced millions from their homes. Questions have been raised about whether the country's federal structure, which is built around ethnicity, has actually contributed to growing divisions. Well, from Addis Ababa, here's Kalkidan Yibeltel. Charni was just another small town in Ethiopia's Amhara region. Now it's a major displacement center. This is one of the six camps in town. Thousands who were forced to run from violence in the neighboring Benchangul Kumus region live here in dire situations. Yeshalan fled her village where she had lived since she was five after being attacked by armed men targeting ethnic Amharas and Agros. They killed dozens of people, including her younger sister. I can't go back there. I can't see the place where she fell down. It still kills me the way she fell down. It torments me. I can't see that place again. Tragic stories like Yeshalem's have become increasingly common in the past three years. And Ethiopia has seen more and more camps like this, in which people...
people who have been displaced by violence. The problem is structural. Ethnic federalism was. Ethnic conflict is not confined to this area. It's happening all over the country. Ethiopia is divided into 10 ethnically based regions, and in almost all of them, there is communal conflict. Thousands have been killed, millions displaced. People are fighting for political representation, uh, competition so over land and natural resources. And the national election is scheduled next month. It's fueling the violence the local hospital. And behind it, there are more than a hundred families living here. They are survivors of a recent massacre where more than 40 people were killed. <laughs> Since the current government led by Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed came to power in 2018, all the ethnic grievances have turned violent.